Ephesians 2 in your New Testament. I'm glad to be here again this year. I'm glad to be looking at people who have been dead and are born again, raised from the dead, alive again from the dead. And we say amen, we read that in the Bible. I want to talk to you about how real is it to us that we're not living our life, we forfeited our life in sin. Well, you know, we were made by a designer, a creator of marvelous ability with great potential and opportunities. But we discarded his wisdom. We exerted our own wills. We've become sinners and subject to death and polluted and distorted in mind. And God loved us enough. He still wanted to have children of his own, of his own nature, in which to reflect himself and to which to give himself in unlimited love. And so God came in the flesh in Jesus. And he actually died the death penalty for all our sins. We've been singing about it. That he might pay off the law as we're set aside the law, fulfill the old covenant, and bring in the new covenant in which God deals with us on the basis of faith and the Holy Spirit and a willing spirit to receive. We are now not to work out our salvation by law, but to receive, believe him and receive his treatment and his new, making us new, really new creatures for eternity with him, to be like him, to be filled with him. Uh, Ephesians 3 actually says to be filled with all the fullness of God. It's just almost uh, blasphemous to think. Human beings to be filled with all the fullness of God. Are we just talking church talk and singing songs and phrases that uh, we all agree to say, but we don't really mean? Um, in all the years that I taught the life of Christ, I was always impressed with Luke 18, about the 8th verse, where Jesus said, When the Son of Man cometh, will he find the faith on the earth? Will he find any faith on the earth? And I grew up in a measure of unbelief in a liberal, federated church in Iowa, and was beginning to follow the ideas of false science, so falsely so-called evolution and so forth. And I had to come out of that. I went to school across the country hitchhiking with $65 to learn whether we could really believe the Bible. And I stayed eight years and got to teaching and so forth. Well, I was very conscious of the fact that many people don't really believe it. But I hear people say, everybody believes in God. Everybody believes in Jesus. No, I wonder, does anybody really believe God to the point of what we're reading about here. We were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us alive Amen. through his grace. In the second chapter, you're reading it with me? We were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked according to the course of this world. That is, we go along with the rest of the world, say, I'm not any worse than the rest of the world. Maybe not, but that's a bad place to be in. According to the prince of the powers of the air, the deceitfulness of Satan, that is. And in that spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. The devil doesn't care much about how you do it, just so you disobey God. Just so you give yourself all the credit. Just so you follow something besides real faith and trust in God to just belong to God and let God be your life. Doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, and that we can't feel or appreciate. He saved us by grace. He made us alive. Let's see, now we're going to get in the fourth verse. <clears throat> Even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he made us to sit with him in the heavenlies. Now, it's not easy to explain what Paul means in Ephesians by the heavenlies. There's no word for places. 
say heavenly realms or heavenly things or what, uh, but it's a little hard to defend any other than explaining just exactly what you mean. In B. W. B. F. Westcott's commentary on Ephesians on the Greek text, he had a, an appendix, a long excursus on the study of this word heavenlies and what it might mean. I remember years ago, try, I still didn't get a clear idea I can't explain to you, but he said in the very first chapter, you know, the third verse, praises be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made us, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies even as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. Now some new translations, the editors think that the in love should modify the next. He, trans, he uh, foreordained or he predestined us to be unto adoption as sons unto him through Christ. That's true, but I think we can't be really holy and without blemish before God except in love. That's his nature. And that's the nature we must receive from him. And I don't think that the uh, French printer who was uh, printing a Greek New Testament for about the third time, and he wanted to put verse divisions in. Verse divisions were invented by men. This is about uh, 1550 or 51. And they said he was making a horseback trip from Paris to Lyon, or Lyons, down near the Mediterranean, and uh, on the way, he was marking the verse divisions in his New Testament. Some people blame the horse. Some say, no, the horse didn't do it. There's not enough horse sense in it, but um, he made many times very good divisions. Here you have two or three places where you may wonder. And in love can just as well modify. He chose us to be holy without blemish before him in love, or in love he predestined us unto adoption as sons. But we will, not, we will not really appreciate fully the love of God in either way. But don't you think that you can be made holy um, and without blemish before God, without any transformation of yourself? Amen. No, you can't. That's what we're talking about here. We were dead, we must be made alive and it is by Christ. Now we're going to see next, I, I do want to make a comment about the eighth verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's not the faith that's not of yourselves, it's the fact of being saved by grace that's not of yourselves. And that is not as certain in English as it is in Greek. The word faith is feminine, uh, maybe you don't know about um, grammatical gender, Faith is feminine, and then he put in a neuter pronoun on purpose to show this, the to be saved, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now and then whole denominations insist that faith is the gift of God. The rest of the New Testament doesn't say so. We can pray the Lord to help us with faith. <clears throat> we can thank the Lord. He gives us opportunity to believe, encouragements to believe, experiences uh, that increase our faith. But faith is our way of receiving God. Uh, don't think that God loves you when you believe, and then a lot of those who don't believe. We don't make God love us by believing, but we accept and, re and permit him to love us when we believe him. It is the channel through which he works to get into and control our lives. Going on now, <clears throat> that it is not of works, that no man should glory. For we are his workmanship. He did it. And we're created in Christ by means of Christ. Everything God did for the human race, he did through Christ. Amen. Everything. For good works, by grace, through faith, in Christ, for good works. See, God wants to change us. I brought a few copies of a chart I made, the four sides of salvation. I gave Dave one of them, but I don't know what I do with the rest of them. I didn't find them this evening. Um, forgiveness of sins, we've been singing about that. We are sort of inclined to let God take away the penalty of sin. But he must change our nature. 
He wants to save us not only from the penalty of sin and the wrath of judgment, he wants to save us from the power of sin and the presence of sin in our lives. And he has to save us from ourselves. Christ cures the deadly cancer of self. Cancer is a dreadful word. And I feel sorry for people who have to face that diagnosis and know that in spite of all of the treatments and the scientific efforts that have been made to deliver the human race from cancer, that it still is almost a sentence of death. But the most deadly cancer of all is the cancer of you thinking, I am my own. I, it's my life and I'll live it. Self. Since I brought that up, let me elaborate a little bit. It's three stages to see it better. There's self-rule, that is the desire to avoid obedience. Now you young people, I'm so glad to see you here, and you maybe aren't like them, most of them, but they so desirous of getting to be 18 or move away from home so they don't have to obey mom and dad anymore. And uh, some want to get out of school so they don't have to obey the teacher and the rules of the school anymore. And they think that freedom is not being obedient to anybody. No, that's, that's not going to be a solution. It is a deadly cancer to want to say, I'm going to run my own life. You do and you'll run it into trouble and destruction. And we just better learn that we don't know how to run our own lives. Christ wants to help us by reprogramming us. Uh, he, uh, we could say he wants to uh, cut off our head and screw it on right. Or it, in the field of computers, he wants to reprogram so that we have a different nature within our workings and the way that we work, a different attitude. And you know that there's a difference between one man and another as to the spirit that rules his life. And like those who are the most Christ-like. But God wants us to be completely not running our lives, but belonging to him, loving him, accepting him, and his wisdom. And we don't have to give up our minds or ourselves at all, except let him take control. He wants to take over and make over your life. But most people resist being made over. They think the preacher is trying to do it or the church is trying to do it or something. Well, the church has a part in trying to teach you this. And tonight I didn't come at 85 years old all the way up here from Joplin to preach a pretty sermon or be a demonstration or to please you even. I came to talk realistically about the fact that when we talk about God lives in us, what do we mean? How real is God to you? Is God really in control? Every choice, every purchase, every program, every vacation, every job, especially in marriage, in family life, and so many things. Are you ruled by your own preferences or by God? Moment by moment, we act according to our desires. And many people in our country don't even know how to control those desires. They realize that many of them are conflicting and fickle and foolish and destructive. But they'll say, well, I'm only human. And I like the way Aaron said this. You don't, you're not supposed to be only human. That's your fault if you're only human. This last week I got a Libertarian Party uh, paper and a picture of a man who was saying that <clears throat> my soul, my life, my mind, and my own you think liberty is being without responsibility to somebody else or for somebody else? No, that isn't true. Especially dealing with God. You have to recognize he is God. He's the one who made us. He made us for a purpose. He made us for eternity. He made us for himself. He made us to be like himself, be filled with himself, and to have the share of his wisdom and his power and his glory and his goodness and all that he is able to do. You see, some of the special geniuses that he has made among men just in this or that or the other feature now and then. Just think, God can make that kind of thing. Amen. And when we have the new bodies, he will, uh, Philippians 3, 20 says he's going to come and we look for a savior who's coming to transform the bodies of our humiliation into the likeness of the body of his glory according to the power by which he is able to subject all things unto himself. Now he's able to do it. He's done a good job so far. We can thank God for the bodies we have. 
He didn't give me one that made me make millions of dollars playing basketball, but uh, <clears throat> I thank God for the life he gave me and the opportunities of it, and, and I appreciate it, and I'd be glad to have a few more years, and if I can go around the world sharing the knowledge of God with people. But the most important thing, the greatest treasure, the greatest pleasure, the greatest boon I could possibly bring you is the knowledge of God. God dwelling in you. Let me put it this way. Every one of us at any age or stage, now I taught in college about 54 years. I've been in school 70 years, didn't learn everything, so I dropped out. <clears throat> but we all, given an eye, everybody, need to increase and improve our knowledge and our understanding of God's working in us. We, as long as they have the opportunity, we constantly, we're short of understanding all about God's working in us. Amen. Then we need to improve and increase our desires, our motivation for God working in us and through us. And then we need to improve and increase our appreciation and joy and thanksgiving and enthusiasm and exuberance for God working in us. Amen. The one thing a Christian can't be, you can't be bored. <laughs> Maybe you don't understand that. I have a little granddaughter, 11 years old, was in our house last week. She said, I'm bored. I said, how do you know that word? You shouldn't be bored. One poet said something about life so full of a number of things, none of us should be as miserable as kings. <laughs> God made so many opportunities and ways for you to know the value of life and to give him thanks in all things. And you'll get a start a handle on that by starting out giving God thanks in all things. Appreciate him and find the advantages of his way and his provision for us in all things. Amen. And just let him lead. And one thing he leads, we want him to forgive us. He wants us to forgive everybody that we have anything against. And the third thing, he is a God of truth. He wants us to give up all deceit and to believe the truth and hold the truth and trust the truth and dare to be of the truth. We're going to read that right here in Ephesians 4 about putting away the old man that waxed corrupt after the lusts of deceit and put on, uh, uh, be transformed in your mind after the likeness of him who created us and put on the new man that is created after the likeness of God in the righteousness and holiness of truth. And the way Paul writes that and reading it in Greek, I don't believe that it's right to say deceitful lusts and holiness, uh, true holiness. Paul knew the adjective lathanos. He could have used it to modify if he wanted to say true holiness. He's not talking about genuine holiness. He's talking about the holiness and righteousness that grows on the truth, that abides with the truth and is not separable from the truth. Now this world is a, is a deceitful world. Almost everybody is a liar. It's kind of interesting, the problem posed logically when Paul says in Titus 1, the Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons, therefore reprove them sharply. And the Cretan said so. <laughs> A Cretan, one of themselves, himself a prophet, said, Cretans are all liars. Does that make... <laughs> you see, any generalization like that can have some exceptions. That this was a true statement by a Cretan. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard the trick of logic? All generalizations are lies. This is a generalization. Therefore, <laughs> you, can't true it. you can't trust it. <clears throat> Look, are you going to deal with God or are you just going to, to theorize about God? Let's get more with the text here, this chapter. It's a great chapter. <clears throat> Therefore you remember, you Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, the Jews, that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants and the promise of God, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, that's a dreadful descri description. 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you that were far off are made near in the blood of Christ. In means by me, not, not that you're 
in a pool of blood, but by means of the blood of Christ. In Ephesians especially, the Greek phrase for instrumentality, by the instrumentality of or by the agency of, uses the preposition in, and this translation of the American Standard Version carried it over into English, and that's better Greek than it is English. In English, we don't write a, pen, a, a letter in a pen, we write it with a pen. But in Greek, there's no preposition with that means instrumentality. It's in that they use for that. And you have to get used to that, especially in the study of Ephesians. In Christ, the first chapter, the third to the 14th verse, nearly every one of those verses, in the beloved, in him, and it's used sometimes in the blood, and it means by means of the blood. Now let's get back to this 13th verse. You that were far off made nigh by means of the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He made both one Jew and Gentile. He broke down that middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. What is it? The law. That was what made the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. That's what made the Gentiles despise the Jews in a way and, and not be accepted. They, they couldn't deal with each other properly. The Jews looked down upon the Gentiles. They were hardly human because they didn't live by the law. And this uh, abolished the distinction of circumcision and the keeping of the Sabbath and, and the kind of sacrifices and the dietary laws and so forth. And Jesus came to make all meats clean all foods allowable, and to make the approach to God and our relationship with God on a different basis than keeping such laws. And he tells us in Colossians 2 on this same subject, don't let anybody judge you concerning the meats or the new moons or the feast days or such things which are just shadows of the thing to come. They had a point in teaching in the Old Testament time. God had to teach the human race to recognize the pollution of sin and the dread and the horror of being, he had to enliven our consciences. And we live in a country in which conscience is despised and destroyed so much of the time. It's amazing to us how young people can grow up in this day and have no conscience, no love for anybody and kill without compunction. And we will say, how could this happen? Now lately I've been seeing a phrase I want to bring up tonight. Where was God when High school students were shooting each other down. Where would you expect to find God? What does this sermon topic say? In the church. Now, just a bit more and we've got to get to it. <clears throat> he broke down the wall of separation and enmity, the law, that he might create in himself, by means of himself, or it went by his own effort, like uh, Hebrews 1, he said, when he himself made purification for sins, he might create out of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man, one two, new kind of man, so making peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body unto God through the cross, having slain the enmity by means of the cross. And he came and he preached peace to you that were near, and peace to, or peace to those who were far off and peace to you that were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit unto the Father. By means of the one Holy Spirit, we have access unto God. We have the power of the gospel. When we begin to believe God's word and let his thought enter into our mind and control us, then we're being influenced by the Holy Spirit already. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, no one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And no one speaking by the Spirit can say God is cursed. Amen. There is this influence of the Holy Spirit when you begin to listen to his word and take it. 19. So then you Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens. You are, no, you are now fellow citizens with the saints, the holy ones of God. You're of the household of God, the family of God, being built upon a foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. In him, each individual part of that building 
fitly framed together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom we also are built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now, where's the word church? He didn't say the church is built to be the habitation of God. You are built together in the Lord and become a temple and a dwelling place of God. And of course, when you become believers and you belong to each other, then we call that the church. The church is a word for an assembly of Christians, wherever they assemble, under the tree or on the creek bank or uh, on the back porch or wherever. And uh, it's just the aggregate of believers together in their relation to each other. Is the church built or is the church born? The church is not so much made as it is born of God. When you believe Christ, you're born of God, and everyone who is born of God, who loves the Father, loves those who are born of Him. Amen. And we belong to each other, and it's very important to God that we be one household, one family, and have one Father. Amen. Very important to Him. I just don't want you to think that God built an institution called the church in which the Holy Spirit dwells without dwelling in you. You are the church. He dwells in us, at least he wants to. And there is no way in which God dwells in the church unless he is in control of your heart, mind, thinking, and feelings. That's the way God dwells in the church. Is it real? Are we kidding the world? Are we saying the wrong thing? Uh, I appreciate some of the songwriters have written very good songs and they had great experiences behind those we become one body, not an institution. Amen. The Lord's purpose working with us is personal. Individual persons are his creation, and he's trying to transform them, remake them, make new creatures, and they'll belong to him and to each other, and that will make his kingdom, his church, his wonderful body in which Christ lives. Can you think of yourself not so much in the old body or the young body or the, the physical body. The life you live now is in the body of Christ. That's the body you want to live in. And coordinate and feed and strengthen and build up and appreciate the body of Christ. Amen. Our doing it together. We belong to each other. I started to tell you about the four sides of salvation. I just mentioned the first two, didn't I? Forgiveness of sin and the new nature as new creatures. The third one, eternal life. Now we know we can't handle that. God has to do that for us. But the fourth one, I didn't realize until uh, several years ago, but I mean I taught probably preached probably 40 years before I realized that salvation was not simply forgiveness and new birth, new nature, and eternal life. Cured, uh, saved from the guilt of sin, from the penalty of sin and death, and from the power of sin in ourselves, what else? From the individualism that makes us not belong to each other. God puts us into a family relationship in which we are strengthened, in which we are occupied, in which we are fruitful. The disposition of people is a rejection of the love purpose of God so much of the time. In the New Testament church, the church continued steadfast in fellowship. And we've We've crushed the word fellowship into cookies and Kool-Aid or into a dinner and we call, we let the architects tell us this is the sanctuary and over west is the fellowship hall. We have a more important fellowship in here than we do in there and uh, the only sanctuary is your heart where God lives. God doesn't live in this room. We ought to worship God in this room together, but God doesn't live in this room. He lives in you or he's not here at all. God is personal, not institutional. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I will build my church. The first time he ever mentioned the word church. And we don't know they mentioned it much after that. There's one other place in the 18th chapter, uh, tell it to the church, the assembly. That might have been a Jewish synagogue he was talking about. But God never commanded anybody to go build a church. He commanded us to go make disciples. And when disciples belong to him and to one another, 
Behold, they are the church. <clears throat> Down in Santiago, Chile, Ed Holt and Chris Dewell <clears throat> went to visit a home, a little home, just about 10 or 12 feet in, in dim dimensions. Uh, Margarita had gotten hold of their correspondence course and filled it out and sent it in. They'd had so many, they were months behind ever getting to see these people. So they got acquainted with her and, and said, would you like to have us come for a few visits to teach you more? She said, can I invite some of my friends? Yes, yeah, sure, that, we'd like that. She brought some of her friends in who were sort of counterculture, who didn't want anything to do with the church. They wanted to hear what these gringos had to say and they filled the house with smoke, they filled it with people, they even baptized some, and they saw they didn't have room, they just got busy one Saturday and doubled the size of the house, and uh, one of them woke up one day and said, hey, we are the church. You can dodge the church all you want to, if you belong to God and his people, you are the church. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a possible parity of reasoning here. Jesus said in Matthew 5, He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father who sent him. He who honors not the church, honors not the Lord who claims it, who bought it with his own blood, and who loves it. He loved the church and gave himself up for it. And he asked Jason and all of the bridegrooms to love their wives as he loved the church, enough to die for her. So when she swore a uh, we could go Saturday to love, honor, and obey. I was glad she did. But that's no threat to her with Jason loves her more than he loves his own life, is it? Now that's what should control us. That's being living with Christ, God, living in us. Anybody who balks about the obedience, well, uh, I wondered if you understood correctly what Aaron said today when he said, Christ is going to bring all things under his one headship, his control. Actually, the word there in Ephesians 1.10 is kephalio, make under one head. That's what the unity is. Everything on earth and in the heavens. And Christ is the Lord of all. And he is making, as 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, <clears throat> the great kingdom, purchasing a kingdom for himself. And then he will deliver it up to the Father, that God may be all in all. But it doesn't say that he's going to be any less God than the Father is. It's just that the Father's in subjection to the Son, the Son's in subjection to the Father, the Holy Spirit's in subjection to both. They are all involved together in everything, and they love one another and obey one another and honor one another equally. Now, I really think that's the Trinity doctrine in the New Testament. I don't think the Bible teaches that Jesus was a son of God before he was a son of Mary. Amen. It's by that that he became the son of God in the human form. Now, when he's back in on the throne, he's equal with God in every way. But of course, he wants the Father who worked with him in all that to be honored and all in all. We just can't see God. He's too big. <clears throat> I have a friend uh, who taught Life of Christ in Cincinnati Bible Seminary for some years, and we went out together to Asia and to Thailand between semesters and taught out there. We had an important mission, and he was telling me that his mother lived in Minnesota. When he preached in Oregon, she came out to visit him, and she wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. I remember when I first wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. I think I was 50 years old before I did. I don't know, but. Uh, he took her to one of those high Oregon coast cliffs where she could see a lot. She looked this way, like that. Hmm, not half as big as I thought it was. <laughs> and that, I, I appreciate your laughing. I think that's real funny. How in the world could you see how big Pacific Ocean is? I've seen it from the air over Panama, over Lima, Peru. I've seen it from Alaska. I've seen it from Seoul, Korea. I've had my foot in it at uh, Hawaii and on the eastern coast of Australia, and uh, I have no idea how big it is. One time coming back from Asia, there wasn't, any, there wasn't any passenger traffic to go to Anchorage, Alaska. We just flew from Seoul, Korea to Los Angeles, one long hop. 
It's an amazing hop. It was 10 or 11 hours, I think, flying like the, uh, up in the high upper air with the fast traffic of those jet planes. <coughs> and I have no idea how big the Pacific Ocean is. It's just too big to see, except when the map is the satellite picture or something, bring it down into our view. God is too big for you to see. Don't you ever criticize God. Amen. Just be glad that God can reveal to you what he can of himself. Amen. We're just too Im unable to grasp. Now, we are to be God's dwelling place. Where do you think God should be? And I think I didn't finish. Jesus cured the deadly cancer of self. Self-rule, obedience. The second stage, he cures the deadly cancer of self-interest. That is, the desire to avoid all sacrifice. You know, it's mine. I don't have to give this up. Nobody else gives up so much. I've just given up. I've just given and given and given. You, you try to advise men, man and wife, they're not getting along well together, and they're adding up grievances to hold against each other, and they're not giving of themselves as they ought to. While I was in Australia in 1984 for two months, I got a letter that finally found me there from my daughter in Bakersfield, California. She said, on the way back, do stop to see me. She and her husband, he was a preacher. They both graduated Ozark, uh, and uh, they'd been preaching about 20 years, and they just couldn't get together and stand each other. And I decided one thing I emphasized. I was, when I came back from Australia, land of San Francisco, got my car and drove up to Oroville for a weekend of lectures there. And that Sunday night after church, got in the car and drove down to Bakersfield. Got there about six o'clock in the morning and parked in front of their house till they came out. And I said, I've stopped here to tell you, love is something you give, not something you ask for. You don't have a right to ask anybody else to love you, but you can show them love till they know what it is. Amen. That's what God's been trying to do. You ever see the movie Peace Child? You ever read the book by Richard, Don Richardson? Wasn't that his name? I think. Uh, he went to be a missionary to tribes that honored treachery and knew no love, had no word for love, and he had a baby there and he just had to live among those people till they could see what love was. Marvelous. I read a book years ago in our library about missions on Madagascar. In the early days of missionary work in Madagascar, a big island off the east side of, of southern Africa, that they found tribes and cultures there, call them kind of cultures, <clears throat> that had no understanding of family responsibility. Every man had been married to every woman in the village. Every woman had married to every man. They didn't know whose children were whose exactly, and they didn't have a word for love. How would you like to start in, in Indiana showing people what the word love means? <laughs> it's a challenge. It's a word that's much used in this country in wrong senses. And people mean, I desire you. And some men call it love when they treat a woman like an orange that they squeeze and, juice, and suck the juice out of it and throw it away. That's not love. Sex isn't love. Now, love can use sex. And sex can be, uh, it was God's purpose. God made sex before there was any sin. There's no sin involved in simply God's use for that. But sex isn't love. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. The Holy Spirit, as has been said today, is not a power, not a performance, not a theory, not a personification of some of the Holy Spirit is the person of God. You see, God made us in his image. Like I said at the beginning, he designed us with great potential to be of a spiritual nature. So much so that his spirit can actually blend with ours and saturate ours and transform ours and we become of divine nature as well as human nature or instead of human nature. 
In human nature, we think it's my life and I'll live it. No, it isn't. There are two main mistakes that everybody naturally makes and finds throughout our society that my life is my own and I'm not responsible for anybody else. I'll just live it myself and it doesn't matter what other people think. That's the extent. There is a New York psychologist named Dwyer and wrote a book, uh, Your Erroneous Zones, and another book. I heard him lecturing on the radio and I got interested in the fact he was an orphan and he grew up under uh, difficult circumstances and he uh, relieved his stress and just saying, well, it's my life and, and uh, I don't care what other people think. I'm just, I'm just responsible for making the most of my own life, no matter who it pleases, who it hurts. Well, that's the way a lot of Americans are trying to do. And it's, it's just too bad. We're made for each other. We're made for God. We're made for fellowship. The New Testament church continues steadfast in fellowship. And I think a lot of Christian churches don't know what fellowship is. We're made to live by the Holy Spirit and be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And we've never heard that there was a Holy Spirit like the 12 men at Ephesus in Acts 19. And we're afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit for two reasons. It takes more than a 35 minute sermon to explain it to a congregation. And preachers can't get by with preaching that long in a lot of places. The first time I preached sermon on the Holy Spirit, uh, more by request in a country church east of Carthage, Missouri. I preached probably 50 minutes and at the door, Charlie Simpson, Sunday Simpson said, someday you're gonna preach till midnight. And right quickly, a Mr. McVeigh said, I wanna be here when he does. <laughs> and that's the kind he wanted to hear. And that's become a great church because that kind of disposition. They want to be Christ's disciples and know the Lord's will. I was called up to Brightmore Church in Detroit a number of years ago to teach them in the morning classes and at night a whole week on the Holy Spirit. And one of the pages you got tonight is the mind of Christ in us and on the back side, having the Holy Spirit and walking by the Spirit means. I wrote that list of things on the kitchen table of the preacher at that church that time just to get it down to, it means that my relationship with Christ is such that I'm not living my own life, but he lives in me. To put it this way, because we sin, we're sentenced to death, and we can't claim our lives as our own, so we must give up the right to live and accept the life that Jesus gives us. Amen. I was lecturing in Cincinnati Bible Seminary about 1963, the New Testament lectures for the school. They called me in there and I was emphasizing the mystery of God's revelation, his revealing himself, the covenant relationship he had and the covenant of life and death to which he calls us to uh, give up self and be filled with Christ and to live by the spirit. And I mentioned that it's, uh, we have to have the Christ whom we believe and who prepares the salvation for us. We have to have the cross because there's no God but the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no Christ but the Christ of the cross. The death of Christ was an essential. In the Gethsemane he begged if there's plan B, let's use it. <laughs> if possible, let this cup pass from him. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. It was not possible for Jesus to avoid dying our death to show us love to pay the price, to retire the law, to set us free, to give us the opportunity not to do as we please, but to deal with God in a more effective way than the law could ever. The law could never save anybody. Aaron was so right. It was weak through the flesh. Not that the law was faulty. Romans 12 or 7 explains about that. But we were made dead to the law so that we might be joined together with another and bear fruit unto him. Discharged from the law. And it's wrong for you to try to keep the law. You should not teach the law. You should not teach people to keep the Sabbath on Sunday because it never was a, the Sunday never was the Sabbath day. You should not teach people that tithing is God's will for the church. God, uh, tithing is just too little and too unbelieving and too non-Christian. It's inadequate. Uh, you're, you belong to God. You live with a love, devotion, and stewardship to God for 100%, not for 10%. I heard a preacher years and years and years ago I say, God is good to us. He took one day for himself and gave six days to us for ourselves. He took 10% for himself and gave 90% to ourselves for us to use for ourselves. Oh, that doesn't represent the truth, really. 
You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Amen. Glorify God in your body. Every day of the week is a holy day. And you're a holy person. And you're whatever you have. If you have money for Coke, you have money for Christ. And if we have any money at all, it's responsibility to God. Sometimes when people are trying to get people to use whatever nest egg they have in a way that is for Christian causes or missions, sometimes a preacher who has inherited an extra hundred thousand dollars will say, but, but that doesn't count. He's just going to tithe his income. He didn't feel the rest had anything to do with Christianity. Look, there's nothing in your life that is not under the control of Christ and the Spirit. That's the reason I'm, I have a paper here with me. What God does not say about the Christian life. He says, let, your, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom teach and admonish one another, with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, sing with gratitude in your hearts unto God, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All is his agent, all on his behalf. You are a branch of the true vine, and the vine is going to bear all his fruit on the branches, and you're there for him to bear his fruit in you. And that's the whole, that's the teaching of the New Testament. And it's not a matter of a, you, you have a part for you and a part for God. You are to have your glory and your joy and your victory in being in Christ and Christ in you. Colossians 1 27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. God is the one who can manage your life right. Open it up under new management. Amen. Ennis Dowling was a great scholar of our movement. He taught at Lincoln in his later years. He died just a few years ago, a little older than I. He was preaching here at Cedar Lake on Ephesians one day. <clears throat> and he said, when I was in Indiana as a high school boy, we kept some pretty good hogs on the farm. We went to the county fair. <clears throat> and it was my job to prepare the hog for the judging ring. And with a scrub brush and a hose, I scrubbed that dog clean, polished his toenails, and curled his tail. I thought he'd get a little, but they tell me they actually do things like that. <clears throat> he chased the hog from there to the judging ring, and the hog found a mud puddle and got down and wallowed in it. And he chased him back to the water hose and the scrub brush and got him ready again. He was hot under the collar about the fool hog, and he was also hot from the August sun and the work he was doing. And when he got through with the judging ring, he got the blue ribbon. That was some consolation. But with that in his hand, he went home for supper. When he got out of the car at the farmhouse, what did he see? The cat sitting on the doorstep, washing himself. He got a flashbang. If I could just take the spirit of the cat and put it in the hall, I'd have it made. <laughs> now, when God has dealt with mankind and forgiven his sins over and over and trying to remake his, his sinful desires, God says something, if I could take the spirit of Jesus and put it in them all, I'd have it made. Now you can see it that way. Of course, it's an imperfect illustration. You know, ever going in rowboats on a lake and get out of one boat into the other? You ever try that? Kind of tricky. The important thing is, let go of the first boat. You'll be down in the drink. You've got to be sure you let go of your old boat and take hold of the new boat. And when you take Jesus for your life, don't try to hold on to anything out of the old life. There's nothing to defend, nothing to reclaim, nothing to hold on to. Trust the Lord with your whole life. It's very personal. And I started to say in that lecture in Cincinnati, when there was a discussion period, the psychologist teaching there on the faculty objected to this idea of sentencing self to death and trying to be somebody else. It doesn't sound good. I said, no, I realize that could be bad psychology. But I'm not talking about trying to use our wills to destroy our own wills. I'm talking about trusting Jesus to fill my will and to take over. By love and faith, you can give up self without losing anything. Amen. When he comes in to manage your life, you still get to be there. You ran the store into debt, into conflict, into trouble, into threats, and trouble with the, with the good and the bad, the criminal element and the law. And Jesus comes along, he'll pay it all off, and he can set it all right, and make you right. 
And as long as he runs, it'll be right. But you have a chance to go along for the ride. <clears throat> Let's put it another way. I told Wilbur on the way up here. When you're going down the road, like I one day driving out to Denver, I was so sleepy, and I had to drive all the way to Denver in one day from Joplin. It's over 700 miles. And I picked up a hitchhiker. I said, I'm glad to see you. I want you to keep me awake. He said, I haven't slept for two nights, and he went on to sleep. And I, it's a little, little harder staying awake when somebody else is sleeping beside you. But I got all the way to Denver and let him out where he needed to be old. They could do him a favor. That, that gives your heart some good. <clears throat> but when you pick up a hitchhiker to pass the time of day or keep you awake, that's not like picking up Jesus. If you meet Jesus, what do you do? Lord, this is your car. I'm your servant. Where do you want to go? I'm with you. I'll go along for the ride. You don't have any plans. And some young men that want to know, does the Lord want me to go one -on -one to Taiwan, find mission field? And he had some interest there. And they, two of them were with me on a trip. Um, and I said, men, you don't have a right to try to make God tell you how it's going to turn out or whether he wants it and so forth. You do what you think he wants done, the best of your ability, and leave the consequences to him. We want to say, well, what's in it for me? How's it going to turn out? What will be the success or failure in the end? God says that the church is the bride of Christ. Can God be married to anyone who is not of the divine nature? Don't you know 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4? His divine power has granted unto us everything that pertains to the divine nature, to, to, the, to uh, life and godliness, through his own glory and power, by which also he granted to us his precious and exceeding great promise, that through these promises and your faith in him, you may become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through desires. Use the word for desire. Epithemeo, the verb, epithemia, the noun in Greek, just means strong desire, controlling desire. Sometimes the Lord uses, I desire to eat this Passover with you, he said. Use that same word. We translate it, or our older translator translated it, lust. And we tend to limit that to some special kinds of desire. Any desires that are ruling your life, ruling your life, without being the desire of God for you, your desire to tell God, your will be done, not mine, is wrong. Uh, it's wrong. It doesn't matter how successful it is. Are you willing to be made willing to have no life of your own except what God gives you? Look, I, I was lost and dead in sins. And Jesus came along and died for me. Why do I ask for any life other than that which he gives me? Amen. Look what a world he has made. Look what he can do for people. Look at the great things of Christ and those like the Apostle Paul who have loved and trusted him. Why are you doubtful about just giving your life over to Jesus to belong to him, be filled with Jesus, to know Jesus, trust Jesus, love Jesus, and uh, Everything you do, in word or in deed, on the telephone, on a vacation, on a date, or on a big business deal, if it isn't Jesus' will, you don't have any part in it. And it's not just that negative. Everything Jesus wants for you, you have the opportunity to be. Amen. And it's not only what he lets us gain, but what he lets us be. Now, will you take this truism, what I am to be, I'm now becoming. Are you wanting to be forever what you've been becoming this month? Hmm. Watch those choices. We live no longer our lives. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Listen, does God live in the church? The church has no faith except the thinking and the desires of the persons who are members. The attitudes, the aspirations, the contentment, and the hope of the members, that's the faith of the church. It's not what's written or signed by the preacher and the elders or anything. 
It's the way you feel today and tonight. God is love. The church has no love unless the people of the church are doing loving acts toward people. The only way you can love God is to love his people. And the only love you can do is at your own expense, taking care of somebody else's welfare to do what's best for them. Having a preference for them. Love is what you do, what you give, what you care about. Now God will not be real to us unless we have some understanding and grasp intellectually what he has revealed of himself. Then second, we have concern. We're emotionally moved by him. If we just talk in terms of classroom definitions or statements without any care about it. I mean, he must be emotionally felt. And that's not a whipped up emotion of false enthusiasm. Amen. But people won't care what you know unless they know how much you care. And you just need to realize God is love and you don't have God in the church unless church people are doing loving things. Uh, Ephesians 4 describes this. You put off the old man who was corrupt and sinful <clears throat> because of the lusts that grow out of deceit <clears throat> and the false wishful thinking. Like James 1 says, you're tempted when you're drawn away by your own desires and entice. And you put off the old man, put on the new man that's now renewed in, the, in your mind. Set your mind on the things that are above. Colossians 3 says, not the things that are upon the earth. You died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now can you imagine really giving up on life? Joseph Tone in Romania, during the communist regime there, before it was ended, somehow got to Oxford University to study. There he decided as a Christian, God wanted him to go back to Romania and preach the gospel. His friend said, you can't do that. You'll just get killed. He said, that's all right. I'm God's sheep, and if he wants me alive, he can keep me alive. If he wants me to die, he'll let me die. It's not my decision to make. He called it the theology of the sheep. Whose sheep are you? You think you own your life? I wish you would get over that. God owns our lives. God purchased our lives. God can make our lives worth something. He can fill us. He can use us. He can keep us. He can mold us. Let him take over and make over your life and don't ever regret it. It doesn't matter if your family objects to it and the world says you're a fool. Look, even if you don't pay paid high in this life, the retirement system is out of this world. 